Welcome ladies, mostly gentlemen, and perhaps even one or two extra dimensional beings to my review of Alan Dean Foster's Interlopers, a 2001 sci-fi novel about an archaeologist who, after drinking a mysterious potion, discovers he can see strange creatures that no one else can see. He posits that these beings, infesting any organic substance, including man, are the cause of most of humanity's misery. When his wife is possessed, he enlists the help of a secret society that may or may not have its own agenda to help save her life. And if Interlopers had made more of its creatures, or had a clearer idea of its plot, it might have been one of Foster's better efforts. It begins with our hero Cody Westcott working as an archaeologist in South America as he pursues his doctorate. Also on site is Kelly Allwood also pursuing her doctorate, and Cody is enamoured with her, not just because she's an attractive girl, but because she's an attractive girl, so indifferent to her appearance, and because no one else in camp had her lightning wit. Lightning wit that no doubt we'll see copious examples of. Here's one. We haven't lost anybody on this dig yet. Sometimes I'd like to get lost. And it is pretty clear from all this lightning wit that these two are going to end up in bed together fairly rapidly. The catalyst for that is Cody has found a secret Chachapoyan temple in the heart of the mountains that he has been investigating by himself. This is a gateway for some marriage clinching lightning wit. Cody confesses, I've been coming here every morning for weeks. As quick as a lightning flash, she quips, that's not very sociable of you. I thought you were the ultimate team player. And while Foster can't do wit, I won't suggest he can only do half of one. The tone here is light-hearted and the characters are both amiable and therefore likeable. The beginning works quite well and by weaving in a number of indeterminate monsters lurking nearby for prey, there's a successful undercurrent of danger as well. Despite the mysterious death of one of their co-workers, the archaeologists return to America a happily married couple. Their find in the mountain is the springboard for both to advance their careers in academia, and they are soon professors a step short of tenure at the same university. They're also able to continue studying what they found, a mysterious tablet in particular that Cody translates as a recipe for an ancient potion. He enlists Harry Keeler, a chemist, to source the ingredients and mix things up. Cody drinks their created muck, and it doesn't just make him violently sick, it also makes him able to see the mysterious interlopers of the title. They are disgusting interdimensional creatures that inhabit natural substances and things, affecting their mood and behaviour, and feeding off their misery. The creatures are described in a suitably alien and disgusting way, though the number of tentacles and twisted mouths is kind of repetitive. The word inimical, which seems to appear on every single page, is more so. As soon as they are aware of his awareness, they turn on him by doing virtually nothing to him. They do, however, contrive the death of Keeler, whose lab explodes in a way that's never really explained. Cody returns home, and Kelly is mostly tolerant of his ramblings on the subject, but of course never believes him or heeds his warnings, even as he rearranges the home and throws out infected houseplants. The interlopers, however, are able to infect a human to the point that they can control them, and two such infected people warn him not to interfere with their plans or to continue with his research. This is a warning he does not heed. The next step from the interlopers, then, is to infect Kelly. Returning home, Cody finds she has been rushed to hospital and is in a comatose state the doctors, unable to see the interlopers, cannot explain. Again, Cody is warned to mind his own business, but the warning now is ridiculous because clearly he cannot leave his wife to suffer a lingering death. Inhuman they may be, but the interlopers are making some Bond villain moves here. A string of appeals on the internet for help lead Olefsa to his door. Olefsa is a member of the society who are not just aware of the interlopers, they've been who they've been calling those who abide, but have been fighting against them for generations. They're willing to recruit Cody and offer to help Kelly. The two men travel to the hospital where Olefsa performs a witch doctor style chant and dance and determines that though he has removed some of her infestation, he needs leaves from another dimension to banish the last. They travel to Austria where the gateway is and cross over to another colourful but dangerous dimension and take some leaves. They return to America and concoct a potion that clears the last interloper from Kelly. Through most of their travelling around the world, it isn't clear whether the goal here is to just help Kelly or to free the world of interlopers, but that doubt isn't quite translated into concerns about the society or its motives, despite the fact that it turns out they do have an ulterior motive. 
when Kelly recovers but is left semi-blinded, unable to see anything in this dimension, but able to see the other one, Cody demands the society help her with this problem too, and they agree because they had always planned to use her to store a monster that they will need to fight against the interlopers. Yes, that sound you just heard is the plot hitting a wall. Cody, Kelly and Alefsa travel to Australia to find Kuwara, who takes them into the mountains so they can capture a creature they call a bunyip, which they then trap in Kelly's eyes. Then they travel to New Guinea because there is a dimensional fault that connects Guinea to India. Because all of this is actually about the disputed Kashmir territory, where the interlopers are about to cause a war by pitting the Indians and Pakistanis against each other. War being a great source of misery that they can feed on, but in the mountains of Guinea, a ragtag gaggle of gorillas accost our heroes, and Kelly's bunyip is released to kill the interlopers among them. Then it turns on Cody, but is caught in a magic net. It struggles in the net, set off an earthquake which collapses a mountain on the Kashmir road, preventing the military forces from invading. Then Cody and the others play music on a didgeridoo and a kazoo, which explodes the bunyip. Because the ending is the thwarting of the interloper plot, but not the end of the interlopers themselves, it leaves the story open to begin a series, which makes the shambolic nature of the ending all the more unnecessary. Foster could have ended the book with Kelly waking and Cody agreeing to join the society, and the overarching story would be in the same plot. The looming threat in Kashmir is only mentioned when it's time to thwart it. The final act here is a touch of the rise of Skywalkers to it, with a lot of running around trying to find MacGuffins to use in one ritual that then, then leads to another MacGuffin for another ritual to fight a threat that springs up out of nowhere. The final showdown to resolve the situation in India takes place in Papua New Guinea and involves a creature only mentioned 10 pages earlier, killing a bunch of runaway convicts that have nothing to do with anything apart from that they happen to be infected. Until Kelly wakes up, despite me poking fun at it a little. Interlopers is actually a good book. She saved on page 250. All the rest of what I've described fills just another 50 pages. But isn't 250 pages enough for a book? Does the publisher or the author require this shambolic scramble to hit over 300? If it is the former, then this is really awful. If it's the latter, it is indicative of an author not really knowing what they want to do with their own story, as I mentioned earlier. Because the showdown with a gang of infected tourists in Austria is the height of the interlopers fighting back and would have made a fine ending, as would Cody's desperate attempts to hold the door closed as Alefsa performs the life-saving ritual for Kelly. However, as Cody and Alefsa approach the hospital door to save Kelly, the interlopers' last-ditch attempt to stop them is quite interesting. A mother attempts to quiet a crying baby in the hospital corridor, and the baby is the infected one, and it throws a small pebble that is infected itself. When it hits Cody, he's infected by it. A similar tactic is adopted in Austria, but it does make you wonder why they aren't trying this more often. The interlopers are initially reminiscent of the mummy. The narrative hints at them being set free, but they remain entirely fixed to whatever they infect until there is a physical contact with someone or something they can transfer to. He had yet to encounter one that was capable of leaving its lair. This is, of course, a very limiting factor. Nor can they transfer from human to human unless the current host is killed, which means that in modern war, which they are attempting to instigate, surely millions of them would be killed. Pakistan and India are both nuclear powers. What happens when the infected host is hit by artillery or something? I don't see war being that useful a tool to them if they're supposed to be trying to spread. And Foster seems to agree when he repeatedly mentions a parasite's need to keep its host alive. He'd yet to encounter any evidence that they could influence a man without benefit of direct physical contact. The scale of infection does amplify the threat. Every significant human event that confounded reasonable intelligent thought had to be viewed in this new light. Generally passive or inactive or inconsistent in their actions. Why kill Keeler, essentially a hired chemist, and only warn Cody who possesses the formula for the potion? With enough cash, surely he can persuade someone else to make it. I'm really torn between whether they're a good bad guy or a poor one, and that ending to the book makes me feel the same way about the book itself. This is mostly because of that terrible ending. Cody, our protagonist throughout, is reduced to asking what his role is and is told, stand, watch, and be ready. Well, ready for what? How can you be ready? Later, he's asked to throw one end of a magic net and then play a kazoo. Could he not have been told that when he asks? Within the ludicrous and messy scramble to end the book, Alan Dean Foster makes Cody apologise to the Aboriginal Kuwara for having misjudged him. 
I owe you an apology. When we first met you, I never would have supposed you were a world traveller. But has the whole book not been about the fact that you can't judge people by their appearances? You start with Kelly, whose lack of interest in her appearance is laboured on in the very first chapter to levels of cliché of him being harsh. Further, the lethal world of the interlopers is startlingly beautiful. Olefsa is elderly, dapper, but an extremely capable warrior. But in opposition to that message, Olefsa tells Cody that he can judge people by their appearance because infected people generally let themselves go. And Foster plays up the elderly nature of Kuara and makes him fight in his underwear, pointing out that the gorillas are grossed out by this. Which, if nothing else, makes at least Olefsa's message inconsistent. Interlopers is a solid X-Files-esque thriller for the majority of its length. The threat, once revealed, is a little undefined. The bad guy's actions inconsistent, but they remain a threat. There's something about losing free will to outside influence that is distinctly unpleasant and Highline's Puppet Masters that depicts something similar is one of my favourite books. This book, though, is generally more light-hearted and fun, certainly more so than Heinlein's take, but it still keeps things interesting. The final derailment loses the plot in a scramble for this and that here and there that should probably have not been included or expanded into a second book. Not only that, but instead of doing so with a building of pace towards an epic showdown, it's a jumble of unintroduced things and threads that get surprisingly bogged down by the need to explain all those new concepts, and also, most bafflingly, the idea that appearances are deceptive, which has been the entire message of the book. It's a truly terrible ending, and it nearly scuppers what was a pretty solid book until its final two chapters. Not Foster's best, but nowhere near his worst. I'd recommend his tie-ins for the Alien series or his ghost-written novelization for Star Wars as his best work. And that is probably because someone else wrote the stories. That sounds a little harsher than is intended. Thanks for watching. Like and subscribe for more of this sort of thing.